Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today. So I said, my name is Aaron Goldberg, and today I'll be telling you about some work I started with Ephraim Steinberg in Toronto and continued with Chabad Ashami in Ottawa, telling you about the best way to transfer coherence from light to qubits using transcoherent states and beyond. And before getting going, I'm just going to acknowledge that in Ottawa, we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe and Mohawk peoples. So this used to be a GIF, but to summarize coherence in one slide, I'll say initially we learned that light is coherent. Light interferes with itself. Light has wave-like properties, and you can look at a double slit experiment and see that. And if you go forward a few years, you learn that matter also has similar properties. Matter can interfere with itself, and if you send that works. If you send one atom at a time through a particular double slit experiment, you can build up an interference pattern that looks something like this. Moving forward, we learn that quantum coherence is somehow different from classical coherence. We have EPR, we have Bell paradoxes, we have violations of Bell's inequality, and it only took toward the beginning of the 21st century, the turn of the century, and really now is that quantum coherence is different, quantum coherence is useful, and it's something that we want to employ, it's something that we want to maximize. So the question is, if this tour of history started from light and went to matter, can we do the same thing physically where we start with coherence from light and transfer it to matter, transfer it to qubits, transfer it to atomic states? And can we do this in a, how can we maximize, how can we take coherence and max from light and maximize the coherence we give to atoms or to qubits? And the way I like to think about it, is that if you have a two-level system, physically I like to think of atoms, but you can think about any qubit that you want. And for atomic states, something that's the most coherent, you might think of as being the thing with the largest dipole moment. So if you have an equal superposition of having the ground state and the excited state, this equal superposition lets you maximize some things for particular tasks. And I can mention in quantum thermodynamics, for example, if you have this coherent state of an atom, you can use it to drive energy between two different systems that would have been at thermal equilibrium. So somehow this sort of coherence is an extra resource for quantum thermodynamics and for lots of other things too. And if you want to create this state using light, there's a few ways you could do it. One way would be you start out with a state of light, some bosonic mode with the atomic state or the qubit state that you want already written in the field. So you start out with some equal superposition of having zero and one photons. You wait for that one photon to perfectly transfer its excitation to your atom or to your qubit, and then your qubit, lo and behold, is in this great state. This is pretty slow because it's one photon at a time, and if you want to do it faster, you can use a laser, you can use a strong laser to drive a pi over two pulse to take a qubit from the pole of the block sphere to somewhere on the equator. And to do this, when you use this, uh, a coherent state, you're using some semi-classical approximation, you're neglecting the quantum properties of the field, and ultimately there's going to be some residual entanglement with the field that is going to degrade the purity of the atomic state that you make, and, and it won't be as good for whatever task you want to use it for. What we came up with is something that we called transcoherent states, which transfer coherence perfectly, and in the fully quantized regime, you can use these to make pure atomic states that have this maximal coherence, maximal dipole moment, to do with which what you like. So this also used to be an animation. Um, what, what we can do is talk about the simplest way of coupling light to matter through the James Cummings Hamiltonian, where if you start out with some number of excitations in your field and either a ground or excited state atom, on resonance, when each photon in the field, that is over here, each photon in the field has the same energy as the energy difference between this gap in your qubit, then you could have this um, conserved energy where the energy sloshes back and forth between an excitation and the field. You annihilate a photon, you excite your atom, de-excite your atom, and you create another photon. When you do this, it happens faster. These oscillations go back and forth faster when there are more excitations present, and that's why using more photons gets you faster evolution, but you also get these different transition frequencies and so you're going to have to work with these in the fully quantized regimes, conflicting frequencies, and get them to all match up and do something <clears throat> nice for you. So here, again, it used to be an animation. But the way it used to work is that if you start out with a field state where you have the perfect superposition that you want between zero photons and one photon with an equal amplitude, 
and you only start out with the ground state of your atom, then if you wait for the duration of a pi pulse for this single photon, it converts its excitation into this atomic state, and you get this perfect superposition at the end. And I'm sorry all four show up at the same time. It's only supposed to be three. Um, this is, uh, you can do with it whatever you want. This gives you a perfect um, atomic coherent state. And the question is, can you do this faster? Can you do this with something other than just a single photon of the field? And can you do this to make a state other than just an equal superposition of zero and one fo uh, zero of ground and excited state? And the answer to all these questions is yes, and that's why I'm here today. So to get some intuition about how to make the, the most coherence in your atom, what you can do is write down, when you start out with, say, the, the qubit in its ground state and the field in an arbitrary state, and you evolve them, and then you say, what's the probability that I've made an equal superposition in your qubit or your atomic state? And you don't really care what phase is between that superposition because you can figure out how to change that later. Then you look at the maximum probability of having this overlap be as good as possible. And you could call this a fidelity. And if you write down what this looks like, you get an interesting, complicated, not so complicated equation that has three terms in it. It's got your photon number distribution probability amplitudes, the same shifted by one, and these trigonometric terms that come about with, because of the different quantized Rabi frequencies where the energy oscillates at different rates depending on how many photons you have. And to plot this, to see how you maximize this function, what you do is you plot the trigonometric terms, which are the yellow ones, and you get this broad distribution as a function of n. And if you want this term to be as big as possible, you want to sample from the maximum of this distribution so that you get the largest probability possible. So that tells you something about the average energy you need to have in the field because you want your field amplitudes to be centered somewhere at those maxima. And then you have to worry about how wide or narrow this, is, this distribution should be. The more narrow it is, the closer you'll be to the maximum. Sorry, this is going to work closer you'll be to the maximum, but the more narrow it is, the more your distributions are distinguishable when you gain or lose a photon. Whereas if you have a less distinguishable distribution, then you're more sensitive to the tails of the trigonometric distribution. And so there's this trade-off that you have to work with between having a single Rabi frequency and having a distinguishable versus indistinguishable field after you've lost or gained a photon. And that's the balance that our transcoherent states maximize. If you look at this, it might look to some of you like a, um, an inner product, so you can think about a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and you can think if you're Cauchy-Schwarz, if you have two vectors and you want to maximize their overlap, you make them parallel. And this gives us a recursion relation that exactly defines the best way to make a field state that will perfectly transfer coherence to a qubit, to an atom. So what you do is, and this is very much in line with uh, Dr. Liu's talk from this morning, where if you take the maximal number of photons in your field, and you take a certain specific amount of time so that you undergo a pi pulse for that maximum number of photons and you don't leak any excitations outside of this maximal subspace, then if you also satisfy this recursion relation, you'll get perfect transfer of coherence and your atom will be in a pure state, no residual entanglement with the field with what, and you can do with it what you want. So if you just wanna know what the recursion relation is for a different maximal number of photons, you can write it out for the first few or you can plot it and it starts to look like a Gaussian distribution in terms of probability amplitude versus the number of photons. And that's something useful because Gaussian probability distributions are things that are straightforward to experimentally generate. And if we want to really know what this Gaussian is, um, what we can do is investigate these ideal states. And so I said for any maximum number of photons, if that maximum undergoes a pi pulse, then we'll be able to give you a recursion relation that defines everything. If here, I, I guess it was the old plot, the maximum number of photons was 100. On average, there is 25. And you can show that that's always true. There is on average about a quarter of the maximal number of photons, which means that if the maximum undergoes a pi pulse, then you have a square root of n and you put a factor of two there, the um, average undergoes a pi over two pulse, which agrees with our semi-classical thing, which says that if your um, qubit is at the top or the bottom of the block sphere and you wanna go to the equator, you undergo a pi over two pulse. But now instead of using a laser, use something whose photon number distribution has a lower variance than a coherent state, which would have the same variance as, as um, expectation value, as average. And now it's squeezed by a factor of 2 over pi to get a pi over 2 pulse. You squeeze by 2 over pi. 
And uh, that's about two decibels if you want to actually do it just with quadratures, and, and it's, it's accessible. And so here I've plotted if you compare using a coherent state to using these ideal states, and you interpolate where you don't just have these perfect times, but you allow for imperfect times and just use this, this squeezing argument. And here you have something like the probability of failure of creating the correct state. Then with a coherent state, when you use more energy, you do it faster and you get whatever probability of failure. When you use these ideal states, you get machine precision and it's always great because they're perfect, but even interpolating, you get really great results. And just to push this further, that was to create a state with a, a maximal dipole moment and equal superposition uh, uh, in this qubit. If you want to have some other state, you want to rotate to some arbitrary place on the Bloch sphere. So here I've put the ground state at the North Pole, and you want to go to some position theta phi with these angular coordinates. Can you do it? And the answer is, of course, yes, because I'm asking you. And the way you do it is you simply use the same sort of recursion relation. You still say, I don't want any photons to leak beyond the maximal excitation subspace. So you still have some maximum photon number, and you tweak your recursion relation to just have some tangent of the angle that you want to rotate by, and that's all you have to do. And so what you do is you say, um, what are these states, even in the, the, large N approx uh, the large number of photons limit? And what they are is they look like Gaussian photon number distributions, but numbers squeezed by a factor of sink of the rotation angle. So the variance gets shrinked by sine theta over theta of the rotation angle. So if you want to do a really small rotation, you don't need to squeeze by a lot. If you want to do a large rotation, you need to squeeze by a lot. Um, if you take the limit, if you want to do no rotation, then you use uh, no squeezing because you use a coherent state. That's the vacuum, and the vacuum does nothing. And if you want to do a pi pulse, where you completely flip from the north to the south pole, you want to state with a variance of sink of pi, which is 0. Variance of zero means you're in a Fox state, which we can also recognize as a limit that'll transfer one excitation to the field coherently. And here you can plot what these, what these distributions look like for different rotation angles. The dots and squares and triangles are all the um, amplitudes in the photon number basis. And underlying these lines, the smooth lines, are what a coherent state would look like um, with the same average number of photons. So if you want to do a larger rotation, you need uh, more energy if it's the same amount of time, and you need more squeezing relative to the photon number distribution of a coherent state. So that's just to summarize. If you want to rotate, say, something from the ground state to anywhere on the Bloch sphere, you can do it perfectly with no residual atom field entanglement as long as you know the initial state and you use a state with these perfect um, photon number amplitudes, and, and you could do it. Or you can approximate this with some sort of squeeze state and still do better than a classical state. Um, so this variance of sink of theta is kind of fun. Um, that sink of theta is where the pi over 2 pulse comes from, where sink of pi over 2 is, is 2 over pi. So if you want to uh, do a pi over 2 pulse, you want to squeeze by pi over 2, or 2 over pi, and that's that. And the next steps are, what do you do if you don't know the initial state? So this is great to take you from the ground state anywhere or from anywhere to anywhere else if you know where you started. But if you want to make a logic gate for a quantum computer, then you want it to work on an arbitrary initial state and see what you can do. So the first step is great for state preparation where you then get a pure qubit to do with it what you please. But if you want it to just work without knowing the initial state, how do you do it? And we can also generalize this to acting on more than one qubit simultaneously or looking at an interaction with a larger spin or something like that. And to do this, you actually can't do it perfectly anymore. So this idea of not leaking out of the, the maximum excitation subspace, uh, you run into trouble when you want to do this on average for any initial state. And it turns out you can't do it perfectly, but you can still get a quantum advantage if you use some squeezing. So what I've plotted at the top are your fidelity or your probability of success as a function of um, the rotation angle that you want to do. And I've plotted the average probability of success depending on what you know about the initial state. So if you know everything about the initial state, you can always get a perfect success. If you know something about the azimuth that your state started on, but you don't know its polar angle, then you can get some probability of success. If you know nothing, you get some other average probability of success. And they're all pretty high fidelities here. And I have to admit, I don't remember the average number of photons in this, but I think it was around 100, at least on that order. Um, and then on the bottom plot, uh, 
this was all optimized numerically, we looked at, go for it. Yep. Nope, I, I honestly don't know the answer. And, and I think it's, it's just, this is, as the previous uh, word I said, was this was done numerically, and we don't know exactly where this came from. And we can, exactly, exactly. You, when you know more, you should be able to do better. I agree. Um, what this has done, uh, but, but I understand what you're saying for logically. What we've done is we've averaged the fidelity of starting in an initial state and ending in a different state over all initial states. And the way you do that averaging changes this distribution. So it's possible that there's some subtlety there that instead of averaging, you just ignore everything else and then you could do better. Um, but that to say, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly if that's what you were getting out for. Oh, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, that to say that the optimal squeezing you need to do this changes dramatically depending on whether you knew the initial state or didn't know the initial state. And it turns out that let's say you know nothing and we ignore this known azimuth case that's a bit confusing right now. Um, you'd say instead of needing squeezing by sink of theta, you want squeezing by sink of theta over two to um, optimally transfer, uh, to optimally do a rotation by whatever theta angle is for when you don't know the initial state. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So, so these were all found numerically then we just looked at what the functions could be that fit, and these were there. There are some analytical things that we can do similar to how we found the large n approximations to everything before, but it turns out there are often a lot of different possibilities in the approximations, and you have to choose one, and so it's not uniquely determined how to, how to find this. Um, this is just to blow up this. If you don't know the initial state and want to make a logic gate, what's the best thing to do? And what you do is you can plot the average probability of success, and I say relative to the probability of success if you used a coherent state with the same number of photons on average. This would say if you're actually using this to make a logic gate, what kind of improvement in fidelity could you get? And it's not so big. Um, it increases with the rotation angle, and it increases with decreasing average number of photons. So what you have is that if you're making an actual logic gate, and you can just use a really strong pulse, then you don't have to worry about anything. If you don't have access to a lot of photons, or you're doing lots of pi pulses, then you might want to start considering squeezing. And otherwise, this idea of having the optimal logic gate, it would just be a little bit of um, icing on top of a cake that's already pretty rich. And then if you want to do more atoms, this will be very brief. What you can do is generalize the Jaynes Cummings Hamiltonian, where you have the interaction between a single qubit and uh, quantized mode of the electromagnetic field, let's say. And you say, instead of having a single qubit, you have these collective excitation operators, these J plus and J minus, that say when you annihilate a photon, you get a collective excitation in a whole bunch of, say, two J qubits or something like that, or one large spin. And here, again, you can't do things perfectly, so you have to look at some of the numerics. And what I've plotted here, got three plots uh, on the left is the probability of failure so one minus the fidelity we've got the optimal variance normalized by something and the optimal time normalized something all as a function of j which is half the number of qubits so these range from zero to about 10 qubits and the things to notice are um oops well, we'll, we'll make it probability of success there's a one to the 10 to the minus five here so all the probabilities of failure are pretty small. The um, optimal variances, this is for a pi over two pulse. Okay, uh, beautiful. Are normalized by something and it's all around one. Optimal times normalized something are all around one. And the normalization is the same normalization as we had from just a single qubit. So what you get is you almost perfectly do the same thing if you use a single qubit or you use more than one qubit at a time. And if you want to figure out where these extra lines come from, you, you adjust the average number of photons that you used in your interaction time, and you subtract half of the number of qubits, and that's it. So just in summary, what we have is this family of perfect states that gave you that you can use to create any atomic state you want with no residual entanglement. We can generalize this to work on average very well and show that squeezing helps you if you want to uh, make better pulses on average. Squeezing even helps when you have more atoms at a time or more qubits at a time. And there are some mathematical cool things with sync of theta that who knows where they come from.
with that, um, thanking our funding agencies and employers for letting us do this work. And I'd like to thank you all for your time.